What keeps you up at 3 a.m. in the morning? Is it a spreadsheet like this one? Or perhaps it's some frustration with a machine learning algorithm that's reducing your complex and beautifully rich data down to just a single number. Regardless of what ails you in the middle of the night, I'm pretty sure that every single one of us is here today because we're excited, we're overwhelmed, we're inspired, and we're challenged by the flood of data that now surrounds us. I work in the field of data visualization. You know, those pretty pictures that seem to be all the rage these days. But creating effective visualizations requires more than just being able to program an interactive piece of software or being able to apply an aesthetic sensibility. It actually requires being able to deeply connect with and to understand people. I came to visualization from a bit of an unusual path. It was the summer of 2006, and I was taking a break from my PhD program to work as a science reporter at the Chicago Tribune. This was the most amazing job ever. Every week, I got to immerse myself in some new topic and talk to scientists at the cutting edge of their field. It was fantastic. But I also found it very, very challenging in part because in my engineering courses, I wasn't learning how to engage with people, how to earn their trust, or how to get them to tell me what I needed to know in order to understand a field I knew nothing about. Fast forward a few years later, I was working as a postdoc at Harvard, and I found myself in conversations with biologists all across Boston about their data and about the challenges they were having to make sense of it. At first, I didn't have a clue as to what these scientists were telling me. It was a foreign language as far as I was concerned. But I found myself falling back on those skills that I had learned as a science writer, how to engage with them and earn their trust, and how to get them to tell me what I needed to hear in order to be able to design effective tools for them to answer their complex questions. Questions like, how do you compare a human and a lizard? My collaborator, Manfred Grebherr, is tackling this question by comparing the human genome with that of the lizard and looking for regions of similarity between the two. Ultimately, he hopes these sorts of comparisons will shed light on how our genome encodes who we are. When I first started working with Manfred, he was using off-the-shelf visualization techniques like this one to look at his data. So in this plot, we're looking at one human chromosome compared against one chromosome from that of the lizard. Each one of those dots inside indicates a region of sequence similarity between those two chromosomes. So the A, T, Cs, and Gs look roughly the same in those two regions. Now for Manfred to look across his full data set, he had to look at many of these plots. In fact, he was producing over 300 of them. And not only did he find these completely overwhelming and unintuitive, but it turned out they were actually hiding some really critical subtleties in his algorithm. We worked together for a couple of months, and we designed a new tool called MISBI. And here I'm showing you just a screen capture from one part of that tool. And MISBI was designed to support data like Manfred's, data that was complex, that's multidimensional, and multiscale. And it was the first tool to fully support this type of comparative genomics data. So in this view, in the outer ring, we're looking at all the chromosomes in the human genome. And on the inner ring, we're looking at that of the lizard. That inner ring also contains one user-selected chromosome that's selected in that outer ring, and that's emanating a set of colored lines. Each one of those lines indicates a region of sequence similarity in those two genomes. Now, using MISB, scientists can very quickly get in and explore their complete data set in order uh, to be able to build up an intuition about interesting patterns that are contained therein. So this is actually an image of the very, very first data set Manfred loaded into MISB. Now, by some measures, this is a relatively aesthetic image. There's lots of colors, there's circles. It's amazing how much everyone loves circles. But for Manfred, this was a really shocking and disappointing image because what he saw was really ugly, messy, noisy data. And this went against what he knew to be biologically true. He didn't, wasn't expecting for there to be so many lines going to different places. And this had all but been hidden in those dot plots that he had been looking at. So 
He spent a couple of weeks tweaking parameters in his algorithm, and he was able to get but this far. At this point, he completely scrapped what he was doing, and he developed a brand new model, and that model gave him this data set. He's since gone on to publish his results and release his software to the scientific community. And I asked him later how long it would have taken him to make this breakthrough using the tools he had available to him prior to MISB. What he told me was, honestly, honestly, I don't think I would have ever have gotten here. Visualization tools like MISB are a relatively simple outcome that actually mask a much more complex and messy process that it took to get there. Designing visualizations for scientists is more than just about creating images. It's about deeply understanding their problems and their experiments and their mental models. One thing I want to stress is that I am an engineer. And so as an engineer, I rely on structure and rules to guide my own design process to create effective tools. Uh, the process that I use is broken up into distinct activities. And it also stresses the importance of a close collaboration with my end users in order to make sure that the tools I design are actually effective for their real world problems. Now, real life is always much messier than in theory, and this is a more honest portrayal of how I actually work. But in all of this mess, there's one really, really important activity, and that's to understand. This is about gaining an understanding of a user's needs and of their challenges with data, and then being able to translate that into a set of visualization design requirements. I find this step to be the most challenging, but it is also definitely the most fun. To get my understandings correct, I work really hard to get into the heads of my collaborators and to try to see the data as they do. I've spent many days working in labs um, of the people that I've worked with, and I've even learned a few experimental techniques along the way. And although I wouldn't trust myself to pipette anything of importance, these experiences have helped me to gain a better understanding of the intuitions of my collaborators, intuitions that I can then feed back into my own designs. When done well, visualization has the potential to not only support science, but to also influence it. But to do so, we have to move beyond thinking that visualization is just about pretty pictures, and to instead embrace that it is about a deep investigation into sense-making. Thank you.